Massachusetts Congresswoman Catherine Clark is our guest this morning. Let's go on the record. The 5th District Democrat now holds one of Capitol Hill's most powerful roles. She's the Assistant Speaker of the House. How will she balance the agenda of the Biden administration with the needs of the Commonwealth? Her answers right now as we go on the record. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Welcome to OTR. I'm Ed Harding along with New Center 5's political reporter Janet Wu. We have come to the end of an incredibly eventful first month of this new year. And here in Studio C, we do continue to maintain our social distancing protocols. As you can see, Janet and I are very far apart. Meanwhile, the state's COVID-19 vaccine rollout has entered phase two. And our guest this morning is Congresswoman Catherine Clark, who is not here in the studio with us. She is now, by the way, the number four Democrat in the House as the assistant speaker. She joins us this morning from her district office in Malden. Congressman, great to have you. And, and you are well. You look great. How are you? Oh, thank you, Ed and Jana. It's good to be with you. And uh, yes, I am well, and I hope you are. Uh, and, you know, it is it is our hope that as we go into this new time and new administration that we are going to be able to restore the health both physically and financially of everyone in the Commonwealth. Well, congratulations on your new leadership role and uh, thank you for being with us here on Sunday. Um, is it realistic to think that President Biden can turn around the vaccine distribution center within the next month? And is his timetable of getting most people vaccinated by this spring, which is what he suggested right after he took office, it, is it a promise he can keep? So uh, let me tell you that I am so grateful to be able to work with an administration that is addressing this pandemic with the urgency that is necessary. And just 10 days into his presidency, he has already taken incredible steps to crushing this pandemic and restoring financial security for Americans. Uh, let's let's review where we where we have been. We have had a president in President Trump who refused to acknowledge this pandemic. Every day that passes in the Biden administration, we realize how little was done to prepare to roll out this vaccination program. But do you think how it can be done by the springtime? Um you know, I had conversations and a briefing with a Biden administrations, in, including um, Dr. Fauci just uh, this week, and they are very confident that this can be done. But we need to put some things in place that we have had absolute resistance from my Republican counterparts and the previous administration. State and local funding is at the top of that list. We need to help our state and local municipalities roll out this vaccination. We need to make sure that we are putting into place the powerful executive orders that the Biden administration signed. I've been fighting for a coordinator, a you know, a czar for our for our vaccination program since the spring. Joe Biden did this in his first week in office. We have been asking for the Defense Production Act to be used and invoked to make sure that we have the medical supplies, the syringes, the needles that we need to address this pandemic. And, and, Joe and, Biden and, and, did that in his first week. And, and yet, Congresswoman, you, you, you're you in Massachusetts. You live here. I, we hear it here at Channel 5 Daily. People sending us emails, calling us, screaming, I can't get an appointment to get the vaccine. That's what people want. They want to get the shot in their arm. So we could have all those parts, but how do those parts get into people's arms? That is right. The frustration, the anxiety, is is record high and you cannot blame people they have been suffering for coming up on a year from this pandemic not only the loss of life but the loss of connection to family not being able to go to work uh not being able to see grandchildren missing occasions and milestones that are so important to our quality of life so we need to take these frustrations seriously and meet them. It starts at the federal level with being serious about our funding and making sure we're getting that state and local government support because that's where the rubber meets the road and getting a vaccine into a vaccination in someone's arm. And that is the way we are gonna be able to reopen our economy 
and resume some sort of normalcy. But we also, on the state level, have to do our part in making sure that it is a system of appointments that is accessible to everyone. And we acknowledge the frustration that's out there, the calls that are coming to my office, people stopping me in the grocery store with concern that their parents don't know how to manage this system. So we have to do better on all fronts and make sure that we are addressing this frustration and anxiety and creating a system of relief. Uh, do you think that Governor Baker is not doing a good enough job in setting up the system here on the state, regardless of what the supply is coming in here? Well, I is think that what that, you're suggesting? You know, I think that we have heard the frustrations with the system that was rolled out with something as simple missing as a, a phone system for backup. We need to take some of the lessons that we have learned from how the unemployment insurance was rolled out, the lack of uh, accessibility that we saw and apply it to this. So yes, while I am heartened that we are moving forward into new phases, the state does need to make sure that this is a system that is accessible, easy to use, and has you know different ways to access. Not everybody has the ability to consistently check back with an online system. When, when so do you I, think when do you think that a COVID relief bill would would reach President Biden's desk? And 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 will the what his ambitious goal is about one point nine trillion? Is is it going to be as large as that? You know, the, the number is driven by the need. And what we are looking at is a comprehensive set of solutions to meet this pandemic, to crush it, and to make sure that we can get people back into an economy that is not just the status quo, but is more inclusive and creates greater opportunity and equality for everyone. So the first things we need to do uh, are looking at this relief are we have to operate on multiple fronts. We have to make sure that our schools can reopen, that we are stabilizing childcare. We have to extend our eviction moratorium and address housing. Here in the Commonwealth, we have seen hunger grow by almost 60%. So we have to make sure that we are still delivering and meeting those hunger needs and reducing them. These are the problems that are facing American families and we simply don't have the luxury of saying which one will we choose to address. We have to move forward on all fronts to make sure that this pandemic is contained and that we restore the financial and physical health of Americans. Um, we could talk about this all morning, but I do want to move on to impeachment. It's now in the hands of the Senate. Uh, can you realistically say it will be more than a few days of headlines with a lack of uh, Republican votes to actually convict Trump? So, uh, let's, uh, let's take a, a step back and look at what has gone on in the Wednesdays in January. And it started with Wednesday, January 6th and a president and other enablers who incited an attack on our Capitol. And not just on the physical building, but on our very democracy, propelling a big lie to the American people that Donald Trump won this election. And that turned into a, a loss of life, a violent incident that put our very constitution at risk. And we responded in the House with the tools that we have laid out in the Constitution of impeachment. But you don't and have we, the votes in the Senate, however. Is that not true? I mean, it, it's a near impossibility for at this point for you to get the votes in the Senate to convict. You know, that I, I frankly, I think that is the wrong question. What the question is, is how do we live up to our oath of office? How do we protect our democracy? That is through impeachment and impeachment is going forward. We have sworn in the jurors in the Senate who are also witnesses to this violence, to this attack. And we are going to present a trial and it was going to start next week. And I think that not only do the senators need to live up to their oath of office, 
to protect the security of the American people, they need to send a message that no president is going to get a free pass on leading and inciting an insurrection of his own government simply because he's no longer in office. That is so dangerous to the continuation of a democracy that it is an outrageous position to take. And so I think this this idea somehow that we should turn turn the page, move on, is exactly uh, uh, in opposition of what we need to do. We need accountability. We need to use the tools set forth in the Constitution to protect our democracy. And we cannot underestimate the lasting effects if we do not say to future presidents, to future political leaders, that we will never tolerate these attacks on our elections and on our very democracy. Congresswoman Catherine Clark is with us this morning. We're on the record.